Okay. Um, good morning. This is Senate Judiciary, uh, Tuesday, March 8th, 2022. And we are meeting hybrid for the first time. Some of us are remote and some of us are in person. Um, and at least for the foreseeable future, this is the way we'll operate and hopefully it'll work. Um, so please, those of you who are watching, if we make mistakes or we go blank, let us know. Um, we're, we'll try to fix it. Um, this morning, our first bill is S4, and we're not taking up the waiting period bill. This is a strike all amendment to respond to the governor's veto of S30. And Eric is going to do a quick walkthrough of the bill. I think we're familiar with, excuse me, a quick walkthrough of the strike all. I used to have this here, Peggy. A paper bill. Yep. Great. <laughs> How nice. Oh, you have a paper bill. Yes. <clears throat> Brave new world. Feels great. Feels All great. Right. Eric, if you mind sharing the screen and do a quick walkthrough. I think we're all familiar with the bill. Um, yes, thank you, Senator Sears, and good morning, everyone. This is Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel here to um, do a quick walkthrough of, as Senator Sears said, uh, the proposed committee strike all amendment to S4. So I will uh, pull up my screen real quick so we can uh, take a look at the language, although as Senator Sears said, it all should seem uh, quite familiar to the committee having dealt with these topics uh, quite a bit in the context of S30, the previous firearms uh, bill that the committee was looking at earlier in the session. So let me pull up the text. Uh, and first thing I want to point out actually is something that Senator Sears alluded to. This is something that you may want to change. It occurred to me, uh, and then Senator Sears, you mentioned it as well, You'll see uh, this is proposed as a strike all amendment to S4. And S4 was a, a waiting period bill. So if you look at line three, uh, the title of S4 is an act relating to, 48 hour, to a 48 hour waiting period for firearms transfers. Now this uh, proposed strike all amendment does not deal with the waiting period. So it may be uh, that you wanna add something to change the title. That in other words, it's a strike all amendment, it's pretty, common, as I'm sure the committee knows, you're familiar with the, they would be language uh, potentially at the end of this amendment that would say, and that when so amended, the title of the bill will be changed to, you know, an act relating to firearms procedures or something of that nature, which I think was what the title of S30 was. Um, so right. just a thought to, to consider, since uh, if it continues to have this title, an act relating to a 48 hour waiting period, that wouldn't be an accurate reflection of what's actually in the contents of the bill. Agreed. Senator Baruth, did you have a comment on that? Yeah, I, I was talking with the chair about that before. I think using the title from S30 makes good sense. Great. That sounds good. That's what, uh, uh, and that's an easy, easy amendment. Uh, I'll just tack it on at the, usually that title change language appears at the very end of the amendment and it's just a, a line or two similar to what I, what I indicated. So having said that about the title, the substance itself, as, uh, as Senator Sears said, is very familiar to the committee. This is what uh, you looked at in S30. Uh, the section one has to do with the prohibition of firearms, uh, possessing possession of firearms in hospital buildings. Remember that section is, uh, creates a $250 uh, criminal fine. That's in line 13 for this. That's the same as it was in S30. And that, in fact, this, this section, there's only, uh, stepping back for a moment to mention the big picture, there's only one difference uh, in this amendment uh, as opposed to the language that passed in S30 and was vetoed by the governor. So there's only one difference uh, and it's in the uh, provision related to the default proceed, which we'll get to in a moment, uh, but there's no differences in this section. The, the possession of firearms in hospital buildings language is exactly the same word for word as it was in S30. Uh, and as we mentioned, it's a prohibition with a $250 fine. Uh, there's some exceptions and I'm gonna go fairly quickly, Senator Sears, unless you want me to 
line by line it, but it, since you've seen it. No, go is ahead. That, uh, unless is that you, okay? Any member of the committee, because this is our first meeting hybrid, has a question or the witness has a question, I'm happy to shout it out because we may not be able to see your hand or whatever. Yes, please do. And I can't see you as well. So feel free to interrupt me um, anytime. So yeah, the prohibition on firearms possession, standard definitions of fireman hospital. And as I mentioned, it's a $250 criminal fine. Uh, we now get to section two, which is the background check provision. And this is the default proceed. Remember, uh, I'm just skipping right down to where the, the new language is. This is the general, general requirement to recall that a background check be conducted on someone when a firearm is purchased. Now, there's some exceptions in existing law for family members, law enforcement, that sort of thing. But generally speaking, uh, the background check is required and it's conducted by uh, an FFL, a federally licensed firearms dealer. Uh, even for private sales, it's the FFL uh, who conducts the check by calling the uh, or communicating electronically with the National Incident Criminal Background Check System. Now remember, uh, what this addresses is the default proceed, and that is uh, sometimes popularly known as the Charleston loophole from a legal perspective. I refer to it as the default proceed. And what that means is that um, the background check, when it's conducted by uh, the, the firearms dealer, there's a provision in federal law that permits uh, the background, the firearm to be transferred if three business days have passed after the background check was initiated by the dealer and there has not yet been an answer from NICS from the background check system. So generally speaking, um, it's, it's required uh, that the NICS background check provide the dealer with a positive result. Uh, when I say positive, I mean that the person is not prohibited from possessing a firearm. So they've checked their databases and <clears throat> based on any disqualifying factors that might exist that would prevent the person from legally possessing a firearm. They conclude that none of those disqualifying factors exist. They let the firearms dealer know and the firearm can be transferred. The transfer can be completed. However, sometimes as the committee remembers, uh, Nix is unable to, to make a definitive answer right away. And it takes further investigation on their part to determine whether or not one of these disqualifying factors exists. Under, fe under this federal default proceed provision, though, if they can't get an answer within three business days, even if the answer uh, is, is not uh, provided at all during that time, uh, the dealer can still go ahead and transfer the firearm to the proposed purchaser. Now, the dealer is not required to, but they can. They're permitted to. So S-30, as it passed the legislature, uh, removed that option. So the language in S30 was that the firearm transfer could not occur, remember, until NICS provided the dealer uh, with a positive, a, a positive result that the person was not prohibited from possessing a firearm. So the three-day default proceed provision wouldn't exist anymore. What would happen would be um, until NICS let the dealer know that the person was not prohibited. In other words, that the FBI had completed their background check and come to the conclusion that the person could lawfully possess a firearm. Not until that's happened would the uh, transfer be able to proceed. The proposal that you're looking at now uh, in S4, the strike call amendment to S4, uh, is different than that. Sorry, was someone, was there a question that I didn't quite hear? Nope. Okay, okay, great. Uh, so yeah, so the, the proposal here is different in that you'll see it's lines, <coughs> lines 15 through 17. Essentially this uh, increases the default proceed time period from three business days to seven business days. So if the, uh, the way the process would work would be, you'll see that uh, the license dealer uh, has to, uh, generally speaking, the transfer can't happen until the license dealer gets this unique identification number from NICS and that unique identification number means that um, the person's not prohibited and the transfer can proceed. Um, Eric, I do have a question about the, the current law would be three business days. Is that correct? Exactly. 
And what is a business day? So a business day is Monday through Friday is my reading of it. So Saturdays okay. and Sundays would not be included. What um, if there's a holiday like President's Day? Generally I speaking, think it was the 21st of February. Right. Generally speaking, uh, I, I believe it would be federal holidays in this case. Uh, but yes, holidays would also not be counted because this, uh, they're closed I, for business. I don't want to screw. I don't want to mess this up. But just for accuracy purposes, please consider whether or not we should use um, seven federal business days or some other thing so that we don't get into an argument about what is a business day. I can remember uh, doing away with business days and um, in other judiciary areas. And I believe Senator Benning made a great poem about it and uh, read that as on the floor. And I think it's one of those things I'll always remember. Um, and so... I, did, I, I, I only flagged that. I'm not trying to mess this up or do anything like that. I just flagged that as a concern. I, uh, if I might, Mr. Chair, yep. I, I think, you know, the federal government is using business days and we're, we're uh, just adopting their language. Okay. Yes, that's what I was going to say as well, Senator Baruch, that, that in the federal statute, it uses that term, business days. So... I think you'd be consistent in tracking the federal language by using okay. that phrase here. But it's a good right. point. And I, and I remember that the poem on the Senate floor as well with the, when the day is a day bill. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I'm glad I'll be remembered for something. <laughs> now, we'll put a little plaque in the Senate Judiciary Committee room, Joe. <laughs> That's right. So yes, that's uh, that's really it for this section. And, th and this, as I mentioned, this is the only difference between the language that passed the legislature in S-30 and the amendment uh, that you see before you now to S-4. It's the change from, uh, from S-30 providing that the, the firearms sale or transaction transfer could not proceed until there was a positive result from next changing that to uh, here, permitting the, the transfer to proceed after seven business days uh, if there has not yet been an answer from NICS. So again, it'd be five, five weekdays, as it were, Monday through Friday, plus, uh, plus business days not being counted. So for example, it could be a Monday through Friday, you don't count Saturday, Sunday, two more business days, Monday, Tuesday, the following week. So you know, it would work that way. But after that period of time, after seven business days had elapsed, um, again, you'll see it's similar to the federal law, look at sort of line 16 through 17, then the transfer may proceed, doesn't say shall. So it's not required that the transfer be made, but it's permissive. So after that seven business days has, um, has expired, then uh, the dealer has the option to complete the transfer. May I ask a question about that? Is, yes, it please. The, is it the dealer then that makes the decision about whether to go ahead or not? Yes, it's okay. discretionary with the dealer. Uh, okay, any other questions about this section? All right, if you could proceed through, and the rest of the bill is exactly what we voted on and passed in S30. Yes, exactly right, Senator Sears. No changes to the rest. Uh, remember, this is Section 3 has to do with the, uh, the ERPO provision. This is the extreme risk protection order piece that allows uh, health care providers to, to provide notice to law enforcement officers uh, when the provider believes in good faith that uh, disclosure of that information is necessary to prevent or lessen serious or imminent threat to the health or safety of a person or the public. Remember the goal here is to, and there's, it's quite, quite arguable that this is already permitted under, under HIPAA, the federal health privacy law, but there was a concern among some healthcare providers that uh, they, would not, they would be prevented and prohibited by HIPAA from notifying a law enforcement officer uh, when someone 
presented an extreme risk with respect to a firearm. And in order to, uh, to address that concern, this language explicitly permits that disclosure to be made. And by uh, tracking the HIPAA language, it makes clear that uh, a healthcare provider could disclose that and that HIPAA would not be violated. So that's the, the purpose and, yeah. and result that, here. That, by the way, is S5, which I introduced a couple of years ago. And um, I'm, I'm glad to see it a part of this bill. I um, worked with our local um, healthcare emergency room docs on this bill on this particular section and mm -hmm. I know that it may be already permissive but there were great concerns about it and there was an individual that the Bennington chief of police and the emergency room doc um, got to give up firearms voluntarily but it could have been a very dangerous situation and this just makes clear <clears throat> that's right it just makes it explicit and clear so that uh uh, they can dis make the disclosure without being concerned that they might be violating HIPAA. Right. Uh, so moving on, uh, this is a section four is an annual reporting requirement uh, that to do with the, the ERPO orders, the extreme risk protection orders requires the court administrator to report to the judiciary committees on uh, the number of ERPO petitions that were filed, the number of orders issued, some geographical data relating to the petitions and whether or not the order was renewed or terminated. So it's just uh, some statistics and information about the use of ERPOs uh, for the legislature to consider. Uh, section five, this is the provision related to large capacity ammunition, ammunition feeding devices. You remember generally prohibited by the legis legislature a few years ago. However, there were some exceptions included in that general prohibition uh, on the high capacity magazines. And one of those exceptions had to do with uh, these magazines being transported into Vermont for use uh, in organized uh, shooting competitions. But that language sunsetted a couple of years back. And so this basically just reinstates uh, that, that, uh, that option so that it, it would not be a violation of the general prohibition on high capacity magazines if uh, the magazine is transported uh, into Vermont by a resident of another state for the exclusive purpose of use in an organized shooting competition. Uh, and remember the language added here to, to uh, clarify that the shooting competition is an organized one. Uh, it makes clear that it has to be sponsored by an entity registered with the Secretary of State. Uh, so that uh, essentially provide some organizational uh, uh, legitimacy to the, to the competition going on. Uh, but again, exactly the same as what was passed in S30. So that going forward, it, it reenacts that exception so that um, uh, high capacity magazines could be brought in for use in, in those shooting competitions. Lastly, or I think lastly, uh, section six, emergency relief. Uh, these are the, uh, uh, RFAs, the emergency relief from abuse order section. And remember it provides that uh, when an emergency relief from abuse order is issued, there's a list of current, this is current law. There's a list of uh, what, what prohibitions and restrictions on uh, the defendant can be included in the relief from abuse order. And this section adds to that list, sub, subdivision E, you'll see top of page nine, a relinquishment order. So that the, the defendant who after the court has issued a relief from abuse order directing the, the defendant uh, to uh, essentially stay away from the plaintiff, not abuse the plaintiff any further and any other conditions that the court uh, imposes. We'll also impose a condition for immediate, immediate relinquishment uh, of any firearms that are in the defendant's possession, ownership or control and to refrain from acquiring any while the order is in effect. Now remember this order uh, is in effect for 14 days uh, because it's a temporary emergency order. And after that, the court holds a hearing to determine whether a final order should be issued. Uh, at that time, uh, the court could, uh, if it does issue the final order, could include a prohibition on possessing firearms for the length of the final order as well. But this, this emergency order only lasts for 14 days and the prohibition on possessing firearms also only lasts for 14 days in the emergency order. So if the final order is never issued, 
then the emergency order expires and the, the defendant can, um, can possess and acquire firearms after that, assuming the final order is not issued. I believe Again, it, uh, Eric, sorry. on this section, I believe it was the testimony of Judge Zone that some judges do this already and others um, don't. And so the effort here is to have uh, geographic uni uni unity within the judiciary um, by explicitly saying that they can, but it's already being done in several jurisdictions. Is that correct? Yes, that's exactly right. Yep. Because I've been had some criticism that we didn't get a lot of testimony on it, but I felt that if it's already being done, then codifying it is not necessarily uh, changing practice. Just put it that way. Yeah, I think that's exactly what Judge Zoni testified to. Thank you. Are there any uh, other questions? On, oh, okay. And then you're going to add a section eight or a section. Yep. Some language eight just saying that, that the, uh, the title. Okay. All right. Are there any other questions about the draft from members of the committee before we hear from Jay Johnson, governor's legal counsel? All right, Jay, welcome to Senate Judiciary. Should I, pull uh, the, should I pull the language? Yeah, down? could you take it down there? I think we've. Absolutely. Yep. All right. Great. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Senator Sears. Um, and good morning, committee members. Thank you uh, for inviting me here today. Uh, I guess like everyone else has said, feel free to interrupt, but my remarks will be very brief. Um, for the record, I'm Jay Pershing Johnson, Governor Scott's legal counsel. I've reviewed uh, this most recent draft of S4 and um, thank you, Eric, for the walkthrough. Um, like I said, my remarks are brief. Um, the governor indicated his willingness to agree to seven business days. Um, and he also indicated his willingness to accept the rest of the provisions of S30 as is. Um, so I think that um, I, I want to thank you all for, um, for this draft, which accepts the governor's path forward for this compromise. Um, if you have any questions for me, I'm happy to, to answer them. Anybody have questions for Jay? No, thank you very much. Appreciate it. <laughs> it was brief, yes. <laughs> I figured it was a, it was a, I do, I do want to thank you for, for your work on this. You're welcome. Um, I, in order of transparency, Jay and I've had some private discussions about this draft, and I feel um, that it is a compromise. Although um, it's, um, I, we would prefer what we passed, but um, this is a this is part of the process here. So I appreciate the governor's willingness, and the other parts of the bill are extremely important, in my opinion. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Um, other questions for Jay or comments? Thanks, Jay. You're welcome to stick around if you'd like. Okay, um, thank you. So um, are there, is there a motion? Let's put it that way. Let's start with that. Senator Baru. Yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> I, I thank Jay and the governor as well. Um, I, I thought the governor's position was very straightforward. It wasn't a position that I was initially in line with, but after thinking it over and talking it over with the chair, it seemed like it was best to um, accept the hand that had been offered. And so that's what this draft attempts to do. So with that said, um, Mr. Chair, I would move that S4 um, be voted on favorably as amended. Okay. I think we first have to vote on the amendment. So um, the motion is to um, amend S4 as seen in draft 2.1 with the addition of uh, language that makes clear that the title is changed. Uh, and Eric, would that be draft 2.2 or 3.2 or one or whatever? <laughs> yes, 3.1. <laughs> okay, so we'd be voting on draft 3.1. Senator White. So 
I will say that you know that I didn't that I don't like the hospital part of it. Even today, I don't like like that because I think it's unnecessary. But I will be voting for the bill. Thank you, Senator Nitka or Senator Benning. Any comments before we vote? I uh, just want to. Um, I guess it's just it's understood that the on page nine, page nine or nine with regard to E, that the order is automatically for 14 days. We don't need to mention that. Is that correct? Or that's right, Senator Nitka. That's, that's covered elsewhere in that section. It's very clear that it uh, uh, lasts for 14 days only. And then, it, and then I did understand you say, and then it expires unless it has been renewed. Exactly. OK, thank you. You bet. So if you're looking for comment, Senator Sears, sure. uh, yeah. I'm gonna basically hold my nose and vote for the amendment, but I'm still against the bill in total. Okay. All right, uh, I just received a notice. My internet connection is unstable, um, but uh, I will, if we're ready to vote. Uh, Peggy, could you please call the roll on the amendment? Senator Benny. Yes. Senator Nita. Yes. Senator White. Yes. Senator Baruth. Yes. Senator Sears. Yes. It's unanimous to amend the bill as proposed in draft 3.1. Senator Baruth. And now I would move that the bill be uh, voted out favorably by the committee. Okay. Senator Baruth has moved that we. Um, vote favorably um, to recommend to the Senate they approve S4 as amended in draft 3.1. Any further discussion? Well, Senator Sears, I would just like to put on the record why I'll be voting no. Um, I was against the original section on hospital buildings because I do believe that unlawful trespass is something that currently covers the situation. And generally speaking, I don't like to approve additional legislation. Um, I am fine with the compromise that has been made with respect to the waiting period. I am uh, <coughs> most uncomfortable, if you will, with the provision, so let me back up a little bit. I remain somewhat perplexed and uncomfortable with a provision that would allow another out of state resident to bring a high capacity magazine into the state while we deny our own citizens the ability uh, to possess the same. And I recognize that this is an attempted compromise, but it leaves me very uncomfortable that Vermonters will be treated differently than those from out of state. Finally, the most uncomfortable provision for me, I know that Judge Zone told us that some judges are actually doing this anyway, but the idea that due process, and by due process, I mean the ability to have someone who owns a gun in front of a judge making an explanation, that is denied to an individual if we pass this language that enables the court to remove someone's property without that person being given the opportunity at that moment in time to have an explanation that the judge can consider. I think it's a precedent that we are establishing that I fear for the future um, may be a stepping stone in other cases. And so for all of those reasons, I'm choosing to vote against the bill. I just wanted to be clear on the record as to why that was happening. I appreciate that, Senator Benning. And I'm, I, I totally understand. And, and frankly, um, you and I are of the same opinion on the magazine ban. It was not something that I ever supported. But it is the law, and this does allow those shooting competitions to continue to occur. Regarding the section on the RFAs, um, I, I too have concerns, but listening to Judge Zone and also knowing factually that there are, you know, the, the largest number of deaths occurring from uh, firearms in Vermont is suicide. And the second is domestic violence. 
And so I'm going to err on the side of caution here and support that section of the bill, uh, even, even though I do share some concerns about the due process. But we have, um, we know what we know. And just as we tried to follow the science through the COVID situation, I think we need to follow the statistics and the science in terms of what are Vermont's firearm problems. And so I have basically, um, I think, um, decided to support both of those sections because of that. But um, no, I, I don't disagree about magazines. It is what it is. And it's been approved by the legislature, signed by the governor, and it, it was a bill that had my name on it, which I will never forget when at some point when I leave, they may say, well, you introduced that bill. <laughs> and I'd say, I didn't, I might have pushed the wheelbarrow, but I didn't finish it. So any other comments before we vote on the final? All right. Um, Peggy, if you please call the roll. Senator Benny. No. Senator Nita. Yes. Senator White. Yes. Yes. Senator Baruch. Yes. Senator Sears. Yes. And um, Senator Baruch, would you be willing to report this? You could probably Absolutely. Re report from last time and just change a few words. Yeah, it, it'll be a short report, I'll tell you. Okay. Well, um, our next scheduled is S-163, and that's at 10 a.m., so why don't we take a break till 10? Thank you. Uh, Eric, yeah. Just and a Jay. quick, uh, Peggy, just to, I'll, I will uh, redraft that with the title change at the end of the bill. And Peggy, I'll send that to you uh, either this morning or early this afternoon. Uh, after you're going to put it through draft editing first, though, right? Yeah, but the rest of it has already been edited, actually, so it shouldn't take long. Okay. Thanks. I'll Jay, um, did you have a comment? Oh, no, that was just a wave to say thank you, and um, oh. I will see you all soon. Thank you. Okay.